Hello, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining this morning. Uh, we will be uh, talking about creating a data-driven culture, utilizing the power of Google Cloud. And I want to emphasize here on data-driven culture. Before we begin, also a quick introduction. I am Avinav Trigunath. I lead the Southeast Asia business for uh, Sears. And I'll talk about Sears in a minute. I'm also joined uh, uh, by uh, Danny Mac, who is a partner engineer at Google Cloud, and Ranjit Kupala, also known as RK, uh, our CTO uh, at Sears. I'll probably you know, just pause here so that uh, Danny and RK, if you can just do a quick introduction, and then we can get into the presentations. OK, thanks, Avanav. Hi, my name is Danny. Uh, it's nice meeting you all today. Uh, welcome to the webinar. I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit more of our data services with you. Thank you very much for joining. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm RK, uh, CTO at Sears. Um, I've been a cloud practitioner for about uh, seven, eight years now. Um, excited about uh, you know uh, being able to talk to you about the uh, how to build data lake on GCP. Um, so welcome, all of you. All right, thanks, RK and Danny. Let's quickly get into the agenda for today. Uh, I'll be talking about data strategy and key challenges that we see a lot of organizations face today. And why is it potentially a time to refresh your data strategy? Then we'll move on to data services and key differentiators for Google Cloud Platform. And Danny will deep dive into some of the data services and differentiators for Google Cloud Platform. Uh, RK will then speak about data lake, automated pipelines, as well as when you're thinking about architecting for the future, when we think about this refresh of strategy or data strategy, how do you need to think about you know, the architecture and how to keep it ready for the future? And then finally, some success stories, and uh, as well as you know, how do we move forward depending upon where you are in the data journey? And then finally, we can also, as, as I mentioned, we also have question and answer sessions. So feel free to put your questions in the chat window. All right, before we kind of begin uh, with, with, with the topic, just a quick introduction about Sears. Sears is a one cloud consulting firm. We have over 600 plus employees uh, working out of our offices in the US, UK, Singapore, as well as uh, increasingly expanding in Southeast Asia. We recently opened an office in Jakarta. So uh, those of my uh, those of you you know who are in Jakarta, feel free to reach out to us. But we also work across Southeast Asia, including in in Malaysia. We work across sectors, and of course, uh, have more than two thousand plus customers. Uh, that includes a lot of customers on the Google Cloud platform. Here is a representative list of clients. And one thing I want to highlight here is uh, we work with a lot of startups. In fact, you know there are 1,000 plus startups that we work with. Uh, many of these are unicorns. And we have been part of their journey as they scale up from being a startup, being you know, probably starting up in a, in a bedroom to actually you know, their journey to the unicorn. Uh, so we have and we bring the depth of uh, technology and understanding as part of their journey. Increasingly, now we see a lot of enterprises also, you know, are keen to know how startups operate, uh, and we bring that learning, and you know, we we enable that you know cross learning across you know the different ecosystems, if we have to say so. Uh, and you can see a good you know good mix of you know uh, large enterprises as well, and we are helping them in their data journey, uh, their cloud migration journeys as well. Uh, some accolades uh, we have won, you know, a Google Cloud Partner Award uh, several times. Uh, also from some independent you know uh, uh, agencies such as CIO as well as uh, being one of the fastest uh, growing companies in Inc 5000 uh, in 2014. All right, let's jump into the topic for today. Uh, and uh, I want to start with and, and use this phrase of the haves and have nots. Uh, when we think about data, in fact, we come across a lot of organizations which kind of fit into this haves and have not story. Uh, those which have a data lake, may have a data warehouse, a large data warehousing program, a large data strategy. Uh, but often they complain that when they think about their data lake, it has not paid off uh, when, uh, you know, in terms of the return on investment. Uh, many of the, you know, our customers and clients, uh, th when they think about data, you know, they started their data journey because there's a lot of narrative around how to create a data lake and why you need a data lake. And it wasn't, you know, really started with outcomes. Uh, so we kind of you know propose that you should work from outcomes and then look at you know what are the data sources you require in data lake and I'll talk about you know uh, a bit in more detail about that. Uh, also, data mart I believe is uh, is is a concept that has been around for almost a decade now. Uh, I have been you know consulting a lot of organizations in the past around digital transformation and how you know functional data marts you know whether it is for marketing, finance, operations, supply chain. 
uh, can be created and you know but but when we think about data mart as well i mean there is there is also you know need to think about it in a different way uh, and of course you know there are is need for more ad hoc environments uh, that that can be created for organizations and organizations can create utilizing the existing you know data lakes or data warehouse that they have also uh, when we think about a lot of organizations when when we think about the first wave of uh, data analytics uh, invested in a lot of these expensive data warehouse you know technologies now potentially is a time to think about it in in view of cloud and how you know cloud offers the scalability the flexibility that you may require for your data warehouse as well as you know some downstream applications when we think about visualization when we think about some of the other uh, aspects of data analytics which could be around automated workflows could be around recommendation engines and we'll talk about that in a bit but before uh, we get into uh, the details of data uh, let's take a look at you know how data of course we all understand and agree that data is the new oil but it is of course getting messier and potentially in the current situation when oil prices are, are down uh, i wouldn't mind uh, saying that data you know it's not just uh, the new equivalent of oil but potentially a gold mine and you need to understand you know how to mine and you know refine this uh, gold so that it is uh, it is you know able to uh, help your organization monetize a lot of data that you have but when we think about the 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 control and complexity aspects of data you know it is getting you know a lot more complex and you know even in terms of control uh, you may not have control over all the data that that is coming into your uh, enterprise so let's look at this you know when, when we think about systems you know your systems of record which are you know internal uh, system server record there's also a lot of proliferation happening here because uh, your data is also on premise as well as on cloud and in many cases when we think about iot's and sensors uh, that also is on the edge uh, there is also a lot more data generated over digital platforms uh, this could be in form of cookies websites digital ads and many you know organizations even in the traditional sector when we think about consumer products when we think about retail a lot of digital interactions are now taking place between both uh, consumers and enterprises as well as with maybe your partners suppliers Uh, how do you actually make sense out of all of this data is one of the key challenges that we see a lot of organizations face uh, how do you ensure that a lot of this data is actually you know also analyzed as well as you know stored as part of your data lake so that you are able to see a lot of insights and we'll talk about some of these use cases in a bit when we think about external data sources again there are a lot more apis you know files push and pull uh, you know situations where you are actually accessing a lot more data you know and it could be in form of payment providers it could be your vendors and services providers that are actually uh, opening their apis for you to use or integrate into your products and solutions now that also you know adds more complexity around you know how you know how to actually arrive at a common data model uh, there are also new forms of actually franchisees partners or distributors that organizations may have and you know finally aggregators and i feel you know this is a very important one as well when we think about a lot of aggregation platforms as well even if you are a consumer product company you may be actually selling your products and services through an aggregation platform now how that impacts your uh, organic channels organic sales or distribution channels that adds you know additional complexity and the way that data may be shared with you also you may have very less control over it so how do you actually look at or create this one view of customer uh, that we often talk about when we think about data also a lot more data when we think about in terms of regulatory or when we think about let's say you know mobile apps uh, and you know there are aggregators such as let's say app any which may be providing you information or other you know uh, uh, other monitoring uh, companies as well that may give you aggregated data about usage or give me you some insights and how do you utilize a lot of these you know insights into your data lake as well now when we think about you know uh, all of this uh, i believe the most important aspect is how do you actually create that strategy and uh, the business impact of not having a data strategy is immense uh, a lot of organizations you know the typical challenges that they face is is as you can see on the left uh, there is a lot of outdated kpis that they that we are using today for instance as i mentioned if you are a retailer a food retailer or any other form of uh, you know consumer products that you are selling Uh, do you have enough information on on your channel on the channels that you are selling on or are your organic channels being cannibalized by the new channels or aggregation platforms that are out there uh, you might not be looking at it and sometimes we have seen situations where a consumer product company 
may want to do this, but it is often too late because you may have already lost your connection with your customers. Uh, that also impacts, you know, in terms of, you know, creating planning gaps. There could be revenue leakages that might happen because of, you know, such gaps that are there. Uh, a bigger challenge is about, you know, how do you create this data-driven culture? Very often when we think about uh, the way organizations are structured, and that's not just true for large enterprises, but even, even in startups, when you start growing up very fast, you might not have a data-driven culture. Uh, a lot of decisions may be taken by senior management or, you know, through other factors such as geo-specific factors, but is it very scientific way of decision-making? Uh, what is the impact? The impact is could be, you know, uh, misplaced priorities. You may decide uh, to go after certain things without having the right data sets. And very often we see these situations, even in startups, as I mentioned, where you may decide upon, you know, or investing into some new strategy, new market. And because it is not very scientific, there could be biases in your strategy. So that needs to be corrected. Also, when you talk about lack of skills, this is again a big challenge that a lot of organizations face today. Uh, can you, you know, boil the ocean that of data that you have? And what is the most effective way of doing it? Uh, very often organizations face these skill challenges that they need to actually boil this ocean. And sometimes it may not be required to even boil the ocean. Uh, there are a lot of you know, tools and technologies that are available uh, for, for us today to actually do you know, some sort of analysis using you know, sampling methods and others, you know, particularly when we think about a lot of automation tools that are available and you know, how do you actually create more dashboards uh, that, that can give you more scientific information. And of course, you know, breaking of silos, as I mentioned, how do you bridge the gap between the traditional channels as well as the, you know, the, the, the digital channels that have come up? That's a very important aspect that you need to think about when you are thinking about your data strategy. Um, in fact, you know, it's not just about traditional physical versus digital channels. It's also between web, mobile, or you know, other forms of you know, channels, as I mentioned, aggregation platforms that you might be using. And finally, uh, about you know, manual processes. A lot of work that we see or do with customers is around, you know, how do we automate a lot of these data pipelines? Uh, when we think about uh, Google Analytics, when we think about other analytical tools that you may be using for your marketing automation, uh, for driving digital campaigns, and some of these could be offline campaigns as well. Uh, how do you actually ensure that a lot of this is automated? You don't have to actually deal with a lot more manual work. In fact, very large enterprises even till today rely on Excel sheets. Uh, in fact, you know, or Google Sheets uh, that they may be using for data analysis. Now, that means that you are actually relying on uh, a lot more of, you know, people dependent processes and also very basic analytics, you know, with given that, you know, when, when you think about uh, a lot of data points that are being generated, uh, when you start doing that analysis using, let's say, sheets uh, and manually, you know, you are constrained by some of the limitations that, that we face as humans, right? Uh, in our ability to deal with you know multiple you know let's talk about you know if you know in terms of variables if there is are thousands of variables so how do you start your data journey i think it's important that you start your data journey with the outcomes that you need to uh, drive and narrow down in terms of the kpis that you're looking at what is you know, important for your business what dashboards frequency as well as you know source sources and technologies that you require so start with the outcomes that you want to drive, the decisions that you want to take, you know, in a more scientific manner, and then, you know, work backwards of what are the sources that should go into your data lake first? What are the low hanging fruits that you can tackle first and then move on to the next one? Uh, and when we talk about that, you know, that journey, I believe, you know, here is a model. And I think the governance layer becomes increasingly important. When you think about the data strategy, refresh strategy, uh, it is about how do you utilize a lot of the uh, capabilities that cloud uh, platforms offer particularly when we think about google cloud google has you know its own history of uh, dealing with massive amount of data and a lot of this uh, products that you know danny will talk about in the next segment uh, you know as as we can imagine is also based on the learning that google brings uh, dealing with enormous amount of data that uh, that that we all know it is very important when we think about these uh, outcomes you know of course, dashboards is in the traditional sense, one of the users or you know, triggers uh, could be around dashboards. We do see a lot more recommendations actually. Think about recommendation engines, you know, which are automated on your, on your uh, digital storefronts. So a lot of this data may be feeding into recommendations. Also some automated workflow based on thresholds. And finally, ad hoc environments. Uh, you may want to create this ad hoc environment for your data teams, for your even business teams. 
So the focus should be on creating this self-service layer where business teams can utilize easily a lot of this data. And you know, think about these four as the outcomes that you're trying to drive or basically the use cases. And then you know there could be different outcomes that you want to drive based on these. Uh, the governance layer, as I mentioned, is very important. It is about you know, how do you create a common data model? Uh, because a lot more complexity of data around data sources, as well as you know external data sources, it could be multi-channel data that is coming in. How do you arrive at a common you know uh, data model, a common definition, a common taxonomy, and how do you control that process both you know upstream as well as downstream? Now that's where you know the people aspect of the governance layer becomes very important. Very often you know companies and the best practices around you know creating a change control board, uh, looking at you know privacy and compliance as well as you know uh, creating it and business stewards which could be gatekeepers for uh, how you know data changes take place uh, in terms of processes you know of course lineage and taxonomy becomes important sometimes it may require upstream changes in terms of how data is being entered uh, how data is entering into your organization or enterprise also workflow management becomes a very important aspect and finally you know when you think about this broader architecture aspect how do you manage architecture and approvals uh, that becomes an important component in terms of you know how you create this governance layer very often you know security and access today is a very important aspect when you think about cloud technologies it becomes even more critical uh, very often if you are thinking about a large global corporation there could be data sovereignty laws there could be other information sharing or privacy laws uh, that you need to make your teams aware of as they could be sharing information or you know if they have to apply access policies from one region to another these become you know, increasingly critical when we think about uh, the broader data strategy context, in, in, you know, of course, in the context of cloud. Now, uh, when we think about the data-driven uh, culture, it needs to be an optimal mix of people, process, and technology. Of course, technology is one of the most important enablers here, but you also need to think about these people and process aspects as you are thinking about refreshing your data strategy. A lot of technologies that come today with cloud platforms that cloud platforms have to offer, particularly Google Cloud, uh, these are on pay-as-you-go model. You don't need to actually invest uh, in expensive technology. This could be for data warehousing solution, ETL solution, or even at the visualization layer. Uh, or if you want to use uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, create you know some solutions around it. Many of these are not you know licensed products uh, in terms of you know you don't have to pay an upfront you know licensing fee. Uh, and think about you know your your entire budgeting you know how that will impact you can get started very quickly and i think you know uh, in the next segment danny will talk about some of these uh, you know products and services that come out of uh, the google cloud platform all right good so thank you very much for sharing the um uh the insight on the previous sessions have enough uh i'm just going to talk a little bit more about some of the platform-wide services that Google Cloud provide in terms of the data um, perspective. Uh, I think when uh, Sears and uh, uh, we collaborate, there was a very, very interesting conversation that we had, which is talking about uh, data-driven culture or data-driven organizations. In fact, we do have a Harvard Business Review report that states that actually more than around 70% of the companies currently do not have a data-driven organization, nor they have a data culture. So the topic that today we have is actually very, very, very resonating. But some of the things that I think I've enough talked a little bit about on the challenge dealing with big data, it's actually very, very aligned with what Google thinks, right? Talk, talking about scaling infrastructures, do we actually have in the, the infrastructure backbone to actually help scale the data needs? Do we actually have critical talents that has the data-driven culture to actually execute a lot of these values in data? And of course, how do we actually optimize costs? Because you know, data is the new oil, but at the same time, containing this oil becomes a cost practice as well. Right? So all these are different challenges that we believe customers are facing today dealing with big data. And this is where Google Cloud could come in as a platform to help simplify big data together with our partners. Uh, the very, very first thing that we have is a serverless analytics, which means that in terms of the infrastructure side, uh, basically when you are working with Google Cloud, a lot of the managed service take that infrastructure thinking away from you so that you can focus on doing the analytics and focus on the business logic instead of thinking about the infrastructure scaling or maintaining. And of course, when we do data analytics, it's not just about the warehouse, right? 
uh, we talked a little bit about breaking down data silos. So how do you bring data into the data warehouse is a very important step. How do you actually visualize and make use of these data is also another very um, important step. I'm going to go into a little bit more of that later. And of course, data is the entry ticket of machine learning. So how do we actually have a platform that's machine learning enabled already and sort of future proof your next step when you are a data driven company, when you have that culture, you want to establish that machine learning thinking. And of course, we do offer open source technology. So a lot of the managed services that we have ride on platforms such as Apache Kafka or riding on such as uh, open source platforms such as Apache Beam. In fact, our machine learning platform TensorFlow is actually one of the biggest open source projects. So in terms of adopting that open source stack, uh, the Google Cloud Platform is basically a, a native in those. And of course, when Avinav mentioned Google has been a data company for a while, which is very true, we have been built for, uh, we've been building our data platform for Google, Google mother company as a whole, and therefore actually our data analytics offering it for enterprise at any scale. Remember I mentioned a little bit more about the servers at the very beginning. These are sort of the end-to-end -end machine learning platforms and services that we provide, uh, sorry, data analytics platform and services that we provide. All the way from data capture, ETL processing, storing your data, analyzing it, and as well, uh, as, as well as using your data in machine learning or even visualizations. Uh, and together, all these are actually serverless. So what I'm gonna talk a little bit more today about is to actually dive a little bit deeper into some uh, sections so that we can share a little bit more of our technology. All right, let's take a look at the first piece, which is actually the storing and the analyzing piece. And if you look at this red square, it's actually very obvious that BigQuery is the center stage of your storage and analysts engine. There's also cloud storage there, which means that you can also apply BigQuery analysis into a flat file in cloud storage. Uh, but in terms of storing structure and unstructured data, that you could choose between using cloud storage and BigQuery. So if I were to just go a little bit more technical into underneath the hood, BigQuery is actually known for the performance as well as the serverless architecture. This diagram actually illustrates a very unique design in uh, BigQuery. If you look at the left-hand side, we actually have a replicated distributed storage that basically make multiple copies of your encrypted uh, data into uh, multiple racks or multiple storage units. And what it enables us is we separate storage and compute. So when you actually have a large jobs that you need a lot of compute power, your compute resource doesn't depend on your storage. What it means is I could create a hundred copies of your existing data. I could map a hundred exact compute engine onto your hundred copies of compute data and actually do the processing. And this is actually one of the very important secret sauce that we use in order to create a serverless architecture that's extremely fast. And of course, all these are not possible without the petabyte network that we have in Google Cloud. So when you look at the separated storage and separated, and of course, if you look at the right-hand side, we're basically using SQL. We are REST API supported. You can actually also use web UI and command line tools. All right. Some of the more unique thing about the uh, Google BigQuery, uh, it's actually using SQL. Uh, everything that goes to BigQuery is encrypted. Uh, it's serverless, meaning that you don't. When when we run a query on BigQuery, you don't have to think in terms of CPU and memory. Uh, a lot of times when you design a data warehouse, you probably have to think about how many queries are we expecting on a regular basis, how large are the query to sort of anticipate the compute and storage and the memory. Um, requirements. In this particular case, BigQuery is a managed service. So you just put the data in BigQuery, we charge you based on the storage, and we charge you based on the result from the query instead of locking you 24 by 7 on CPU and memory. And that's very unique. Uh, we provide real-time insight from streaming data. With some of the ETL tools that we provide, you can actually stream real-time data and get real-time results from BigQuery. So a query that you run now versus a query to one, two minutes later would result in different real-time analysis. Uh, we have built in machine learning for all of the box predictive insight. I'm gonna go into a little bit more details on that. There are multiple spectrum on how you can actually use machine learning. And of course, 
if you are using an existing visualization tools, we do have an in-memory BI engine that allows you to connect to an existing visualization tools with a much faster and much more interactive analysis. Uh, tools such as Looker is one of the examples that we, uh, we work with. All right, uh, there's a very interesting um, uh, report that came out from ESG, basically that says BigQuery is actually a clear winner in terms of the total cost of ownership over three years of for on-prem and in fact on another competitor's platform. And one of the major reasons on that is because you are running a serverless data warehouse, meaning that you don't have to think about identifying the number of CPU and number of memory. And this is a huge cost driver when you design a data warehouse because we, as we all know, your data warehouse, um, the faster you want your data warehouse, the, the, the higher these bandwidth you need to set. I do want to jump hands on and show you a very quick demo on the BigQuery. So this is where I'm going to leave my screen and go directly to my BigQuery console. Uh, so this is actually our Google Cloud Platform BigQuery console, and this is a web UI interface. Again, you could use um, uh, REST API as well as client library in your applications in order to get there. One of the very interesting things about BigQuery is on top of your own data set, there's also a lot of public data, right? Uh, I mean, for, for, for the purpose of today's demo, I can show you some public data, but of course uh, you will find some of these quite useful and quite interesting. One of the public data sets that I love a lot is Wikipedia because everyone uses Wikipedia and everyone knows what it is, right? In this particular case, let's take a look at the page view 2019 table. In this particular case, you can see that uh, this is the schema of a table. So it's actually quite narrow. Um, it's not a very fat table, but if you look into the details of this, you know that this table is actually 2.3 terabyte. It's not super big uh, in an enterprise perspective, but it's sizable enough for us to do a demo. Uh, number of rows, because it's a very narrow table, it has 57 billions of rows. And basically what it shows you is the uh, timestamp, which wiki title and how many views were there. And of course, just to give you a preview of what that table looks like, right? Uh, I'm just gonna show you a couple of rows, right? Uh, 57 billion rows here, right? If you were to run a query on the 57 billion rows data in your traditional data warehouse, how long do you think it will take? Now I'm adding a little bit complexity here because the, of course, it's just like a cooking show. I've prepared my SQL statement. This is a very typical SQL statement for those of you who, 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 who has been playing around with data. You know that what I'm doing is I'm basically selecting the title and the total number of view from this particular table. I'm using a very simple timestamp because it's the page view 2019. I'm basically capturing everything. Uh, well, actually, I'm capturing everything up to December 20, uh, 30th. I'm using a regular expression match, right? This is where, you know, the compute intents come in, right? I'm basically trying to match everything that's similar to Google. I'm grouping them by title and then sorting them by decreasing order. This table is gonna query around two terabytes. So if we were to run this query, typically, how long do you think it, ah, I cheated a little bit here. You see that this is actually cache result. So let me go disable my cache so that, you know, I'm not cheating here. So I'm not gonna, use cache result, I'm just gonna rerun the entire query right away. This is the fun of live demo. So typically when you do a data warehouse on uh, 57 billion rows, you probably will run a job, have lunch, come back, and hopefully there's no error statement. And then you'll be able to see maybe partially the result. We, we're probably talking about hours, if not days of job, depending on how your data is being structured for uh, sorting and uh, regular expression search, right? In this particular case, I actually, without cache, I was able to finish this query in 20.7 seconds. And I've actually processed it to two terabytes. And this is actually my result, right? So the number one search Google uh, Wikipedia page that matches that regular expressions, it's basically Google, right? And it has a total view of around 1.17 uh, million, yeah. That sounds about right. And if you were to sort of just go underneath the hood, what happens is we basically compressed the, this number of slot time hours into 20.7 seconds because we make multiple copies of your data. We apply multiple compute into this query and we create the, the result. So I just want to show you when people say BigQuery is fast, um, 
you probably have to see it to believe it, but underneath the hood, we actually use this secret source of separating storage and separating compute. We use the petabyte network to make sure that they collaborate very, very fast. And we are able to query uh, 57 billion rows, a two terabyte database with regular expression search with sorting all the way down to 20 seconds. So, so I just want to show you this. Uh, can you imagine your data culture change when you can generate report this fast, this simple, this easy, when uh, it wasn't like an hour job, when it was a minute or when it was a second job, when you actually com compress a monthly report. So this is the power of not just the platform features, but as well as changing that culture. All right. And of course, what I've shown you er, uh, just now, it's basically just the data warehousing part, right? If we were to think about some of the more important challenge. There's also breaking down data silos, which Avinav mentioned, and I know RK is actually go quite in depth into this one. I just want to show you that in the Google Cloud Platform, we do have a bunch of managed service, such as a managed version of Apache Kafka message in PubSub. We do have a managed version of Apache Beam in data in data flow that allows you to actually create ingestions, create ETL in a service uh, managed service manner. And of course, what I've shown you er, uh, just now, it's basically just the data warehousing part, right? If we were to think about some of the more important challenge, there's also breaking down data silos, which Avinav mentioned, and I know RK is actually go quite in depth into this one. I just want to show you that in the Google Cloud Platform, we do have a bunch of managed service, such as a managed version of Apache Kafka message in PubSub. We do have a managed version of Apache Beam in data in data flow that allows you to actually create ingestions, create ETL in a service uh, managed service manner. What it means is again, you don't have to provision infrastructure. You don't have to provision about, you don't have to worry about turning machines on and off. You just have to write code on top of it. And of course, since RK is gonna focus a lot more on how do you break down the data structure, I'll leave that deep dive to him and I'll probably just talk about another very important spectrum, which is the governing part, which is something that Avinav mentioned. So what I've showed you earlier about the data ingestions as well as the data uh, uh, warehouse, it's extremely powerful, right? But just like Spider-Man said, with great power come great responsibility. So how do we actually make sure that we apply that responsibility part? When you use Google Cloud Platform, the data governance and security actually comes with it. If you are not new to the platform, you probably know what IAM is. It stands for Identity and Access Management, and it basically gives you granular control in terms of these policies called whose account have access to what. For an example, you could give a read-only access to this big query data sets to this specific account so that he or she can only read the query but cannot submit a job. Vice versa, you could create a job submission role without reading the result, right? So, so it gives you a very, very granular control in terms of um, individual access as well as group access if you were to group this identity into a group. We do have a tool that's called Data Catalog that actually allows you to go through data discovery in BigQuery. So things such as understanding the data sets, what kind of data are in data sets, it basically give you metadata management and data discovery in a large scale managed uh, user interface way. Everything that's moved into Google Cloud, it's always encrypted, meaning that um, it's secure at rest and it's also secure in transit. Uh, there's actually not an option for you to not use an encrypt data. The only option that we give you is to whether use a Google managed key or to use your own key so that you could keep the secret somewhere else as well. We do have a managed API that's called DLP, Data Loss Prevention. What it does is basically go through the um, data that's on GCP using Google machine learning model to identify the potentials of this data being sensitive data. So what it does is it actually helps you classify. For example, this CSV file or this RVO file contains potentially credit card information which you like to review. We can help discover, classify, and to a certain way, mask it. We can do a directional mask, meaning that I want to hide all the email address using an encryption and I can decrypt it when I finish all the data warehouse uh, work. And of course, 
all these share all, all these data are being shareable to read only data using IAM and a combination of these security tools. So this is actually very important because when you look at moving data into the cloud, there's definitely a lot of the governance questions, security questions, and with a very high level glimpse of this, the platform has actually provide a lot of these security um, features out of the box. And of course, just to show some third party audits and certifications, Google Cloud, it's actually certified in a lot of the ISO, SOC standard. And if you were to look into our region, the Singapore MTCS tier three is actually something that's um, quite recent as well as quite uh, significant in terms of users in Singapore and in this part of uh, ASEAN region. And of course, um, with the governance, with the data ingestions and with the warehousing, we definitely want to look at the last part of this exercise, which is how do we actually use the data? I know it's funny enough, uh, I've not talked a little bit about sheets, right? Uh, I agree completely with him, right? The human aspect of using sheets can sometimes be the potential limitations. But I think one thing that we definitely want to mention as well, it's when you have users that slowly shifting that data culture, uh, enabling an option for them using BigQuery and Sheets, it's something that we, we uh, it's available right now. So for example, if you are already running a lot of report in Sheets, while you're going through that data culture mind shift journey, you, you, you also know that a lot of these data that you put into BigQuery support interactions with Sheets. So for you, for those of you who could actually sort of shape that culture at your own pace. But of course, when we look at data in BigQuery, it's not just about Sheet. There's also the BI engine. And the BI engine enabling it is just as simple as checking a box on the BigQuery. I, I should have shown you in the console earlier. Uh, it's basically a checkbox, and you give the BigQuery BI engine an estimations of how many reporting hours you need. And then it will actually provision an in-memory BI engine that extract data from your BigQuery storage and then use an in-memory um, uh, 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 use an in-memory database to communicate with any of your visualization tools. Again, examples such as Looker and all the other popular um, visualization tools that you have been using will be able to integrate with BI engines. And of course, while we talk about visualizations, there's also something that's very interesting about artificial intelligence. And this is where Google Cloud comes in providing three, three different platforms of three different layers. For the purpose of today's conversation, I'm not gonna go very deep into this. Uh, if you want to have uh, more in-depth conversations, more than happy to talk to um, you and together with Sears to actually go through this uh, artificial intelligence journey. But basically we understand that in the talent pool out there, there's not a lot of machine learning experts. So that's why we're trying to create different levels of tools that allows different uh, skills level users to adopt artificial intelligence. If you look at the top of the screen, we do have the AI platform. So for those of you who know what TensorFlow Ski Kit is, um, it's just business as usual for you, but we create a managed platform that allows you to use a Kubeflow type of uh, pipeline to actually manage your end-to-end -end, um, machine learning pipeline. So what it means is you can actually run manage Jupyter Notebook. You could deploy manage Jupyter Notebook module into individual Jupyter Notebook, and then you could create a Jupyter pipeline to actually productize a lot of these models. And then you could sort of create a feedback loop as well in case your result is not good. But of course, for most of us here who is not an expert in machine learning, then what we can do is we could use BigQuery built-in features called BQML. What it does is basically allows you to create a machine learning model using BQ SQL like symptoms. So instead of select, you use a terminology called create, and then you basically identify the output parameter. You've identified what are the input parameters, what's your sort of model type. This is where the machine learning uh, knowledge comes in. You potentially apply the model type. You give it a little bit of a hyperparameter tuning, how many layers of neural network I want to create, how do I actually fine tune the model. And using this SQL like statement, you could actually create a model that will be that will be able to that will allow you to run predictions on BigQuery. And of course, if you were to look at the AutoML and the Cloud ML APIs, these are actually the early adopters um, area where um, if you know how to call an API, if you have your own data sets, 
then you can actually let Google Cloud Platform do most of the work for you, right? So instead of writing SQL code, Jupyter code, Python code, you don't have to write any code for you to actually use these APIs. But why do we actually focus this much on BigQuery? It's because BigQuery is actually AI ready. So if you look at BigQuery, the data that you store in this data warehouse actually applies for all these platforms. So if you look at the machine learning frameworks, BigQuery actually have a native TensorFlow reader. It has a Spark ML integrations. It does provide a high performance input and output API for those of you who really need to extract the entire data sets out. And of course, it's actually a default data source for one of the very simple to use features called AutoML, which basically create a, a um, machine learning model likely regression, likely classifications for you to actually identify input and output field. But, but, but BigQuery is actually well connected to all the different layers of the machine learning offering that we provide. And we also did mention very quickly about creating a model, right? So if you write a SQL statement, just like what the animation is showing you, if you create, you could actually execute a training and then you could reuse this training by using select from instead of from a table, you, 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 you select data from your trained model. And that's all it takes for you to actually create a machine learning model in BigQuery. Uh, again, not going to dive very deep into this today, but um, this is definitely a topic that a lot of people are asking. In terms of the easy to use machine learning APIs, we basically break it down into unstructured and structured data, right? So you have the site in a lot of the image recognitions, uh, OCR tagging. We do have an auto ML version and the normal version for you. So the normal version actually have pre-trained model where the auto ML version allows you to bring your own data and train. For example, if I were a manufacturing company, Cloud Vision would be able to tell me this is a car, but using your own data, you will be able to train a unique model that's only available to you to identify whether this is a BMW, a Tesla, or a Mercedes-Benz, or something else, right? So this is where you can bring data into insight. Very uh, similarly, in the language, you have translations and natural language processing for sentiment analysis and entity detections. We do have an auto ML version of that. And in conversation AI, we have a dialogue flow enterprise that allows you to use uh, to create a conversation experience in voice and text chatbot with the complementary text to speech and speech to text APIs. If you have structured data, um, auto ML tables can directly text these data from BigQuery. And we also have a recommendations AI. A lot of these unstructured machine learning API is also a good protocol for you to convert unstructured data into structured data. For example, if I have 2,000 images, there's no way for me to have a structured way to store it. But with Cloud Vision, you might be able to store it according to the entity that you detect, according to the color scheme that you detect, or even the number of character that you could detect on each image. You can use this to easily sort a lot of the unstructured data into something that's structured. So I just want to sort of summarize here, uh, talk a, quite a lot about the different services. I've showed you a demo, uh, but one of the very important things is our Google Cloud Platform. It's delivering a serverless data analytics experience. It provides tools from end-to-end -end data lifecycle. It has a very strong embedded machine learning. It's embraced open source and is actually built for enterprise at any scales. And with that, I think I will pass this back to RK. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Thanks, Danny. Um, that was very helpful. Nice demo. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I hope everyone can see my screen. So basically, we're going to talk about um, you, we heard uh, the business uh, aspect from Avinav on uh, you know the data strategy on uh, public cloud, Google Cloud, and we've also gone through uh, some of the uh, you know demos and uh, uh, services related details from Danny. I thought that uh, I'd focus more on um, you, you know some of the implementations that we have done for our customers. Um, so. Uh, this architecture uh, depicts how we can build uh, an enterprise data lake on GCP. Now, uh, before we get deeper into uh, this data lake architecture diagram itself, uh, I'd like to point out that data lake actually means multiple things, different things to different people. Uh, 
I know of uh, customers who build, uh, you know, uh, data lakes in uh, completely self-managed Hadoop clusters, or Cloudera or Hortonworks, uh, you know, kind of distributions. Um, I've seen customers who uh, completely load all of their data to BigQuery, and that sort of becomes their data lake. Uh, and but ever since the advent of uh, uh, you know object store storage on public cloud, uh, and you, you know uh, in this case uh, Google Cloud Storage that is at the center of this architecture diagram, um, it kind of became uh, an, a, an accepted definition that a uh, you know data lake is uh, something where you can actually uh, so an organization generates uh, different types of data right so. Uh, structured, unstructured. These days, uh, you know, something as dumb as a fridge also has an IP address, and it also generates data uh, in terms of you know any action that needs to be taken, so on and so forth. So there is uh, data that is being produced everywhere, um, and it is different types in nature, right? So uh, some data is with the uh, database administrator's team in your enterprise, uh, if you're familiar with that kind of environment, they are the custodians of the data. Uh, some data is actually coming from outside, uh, you know, that you do not directly control, let's say the social media. Uh, there are sensors which generate data and all of that. Um, the point that I wanted to make with all of this is that there is uh, different types of data and uh, changes at different frequencies and uh, there are uh, different types of personas involved in actually handling this data uh, or you know giving you access to this data right so there are uh, data engineers database administrators there are application developers who uh, you know make this data available for your downstream um, you know, customers etc so on and so forth now but a data lake uh, is uh, something that allows you to capture all of these data from uh, you know no matter what kind um, and uh, without actually performing ETL, right? So in its raw format, uh, and uh, it, whether it is real time or whether it is batch, it should support both of those. That's what you see on the ingestion side. There are uh, multiple services here. Uh, we'll talk about them in a bit. Um, and then uh, it, you should be able to store all of this data in a central place. In this case, it's uh, Google Cloud Storage. And, uh, and you know this data should be easily discoverable and I see uh, one of you have even asked the question about uh, you know data lineage, et cetera, right? So um, be, being able to uh, easily, so uh, all of this data captured uh, and saved in an organized format um, and uh, easily discoverable uh, with data lineage and all that. And, uh, uh, and, and other aspects of the data lake is also uh, security and how do you enable access, uh, whether you can construct user interfaces on top of it. And the most important part, uh, after you ingest data and you uh, are able to e easily discover this, and uh, it is safe and secure, and you will allow uh, access to the data as is uh, to your respective end users. Uh, also, depending on the nature of uh, problem that you are trying to solve, you should be able to pick up uh, multiple uh, you know, different, uh, you know, analytics approaches or advanced analytics tools uh, to be able to achieve uh, the use case that you're trying to solve for. Uh, that's basically, you, you know, the accepted overall uh, modern data lake definition, right? So now we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how, uh, you know, we can build all of this in uh, Google Cloud. Um, so first, the most important thing is where we are storing all of this data, uh, Google Cloud Storage. Um, it's an infinitely scalable object store. Um, you, you can pretty much uh, store any kind of data here, uh, you know, uh, flat files and uh, videos and audio uh, and pretty much whatever you can think of. So all of this data goes here. There are different tiers of storage um, available depending upon your uh, you know necessity uh, so uh, there are uh, uh, things related to durability there are things related to how frequently do you access this data um, so basically there is uh, you know the general uh, purpose uh, you know storage available and also near line and uh, cold line uh, there are multiple tires available right uh, the good thing uh, which is uh, uh, stand out from other public cloud platforms is that uh, even if it is archival storage, uh, even if it is in, let's say, near line or cold line, uh, the way the, that you access this data, interact with it, uh, the same tools uh, like GSUtil, the same API interface, uh, and 
the same kind of performance is guaranteed uh, across all of these uh, you know uh, uh, storage tires so uh, that actually makes it really uh, uh, lucrative, uh, you know, a good choice for us to uh, maintain our data lake because you can write object lifecycle policies and ensure that uh, the data that you don't want uh, can be automatically moved to the other tiers of storage so that you don't end up, uh, uh, you know, paying a lot of money. And at the same time, you're not sacrificing uh, performance, uh, etc. Right. So that's uh, that's good about the uh, cloud storage. And after we store data, one of the important things is like, how do we really secure? And we'll talk about ingestion in, you know, in detail in a bit. Um, how, how, what do we have uh, in terms of, uh, I know Danny touched upon a little bit on um, the security aspects, uh, but basically these are the options that are available for us. Uh, Cloud IAM is um, uh, identity and access control. You see that featured here and also in access uh, uh, user interfaces as well. Uh, basically, um, it, you, you know, it works via uh, cloud identity. If you are a G Suite customer already, or you, if you're using G Gmail, um, you, you know, you're already using cloud identity. You can actually create groups here and then uh, map these groups to uh, specific uh, roles, uh, you, know, you know, in Google Cloud. Uh, which grant access to one or you know uh, multiple resources or just limit access to one resource in the manner that you would like um, and then uh, also uh, you, you know we briefly talked about the encryption Danny mentioned it uh, uh, you know all of the data by default uh, at rest and in transit is encrypted uh, some of the customers would want to um, and the so the fact that it is encrypted there are keys involved here uh, generally the platform itself takes care of the key management for you uh, but for some uh, organizations which have to be compliant with certain you know, standards they have to bring their own keys uh, so Google Cloud allows you to either, uh, you know, bring your own keys. Uh, so there are a couple of different type options available there. Uh, customer supplied uh, encryption keys and customer managed encryption keys. Um, and, you know, that uh, you have full control on what is possible. And also uh, one of the other things that, uh, uh, the other thing about Cloud IAM is that uh, if you are coming from enterprise and your identity is currently with Active Directory, you can federate that with uh, uh, Cloud IAM and use the same identity to, uh, you know, grant rest of the permissions on Google Cloud Storage, so on and so forth. And then uh, one of the features that we, uh, re you know, recently started heavily advocating uh, is the identity aware proxy. Uh, basically, it allows you to, uh, at a platform level, uh, you know, this it comes from the beyond corp philosophy of um, if you have to secure something, don't just depend on the network, uh, you know. Uh, uh, perimeter security uh, also tap into uh, you know a, an alternate way of uh, authenticating uh, which <clears throat> does not require you to manage uh, <clears throat> excuse me uh, vpn devices so on and so forth right so uh, we have that option available as well and then if you have to selectively uh, enable access for people uh, then you can have signed urls and you know access to tokens granted uh, that will expire after some, some time so on and so forth and then the access and user interface so once you have all of this data for example if you'd like to uh, make it some of it available uh, either in the raw form or in the you know uh, processed form uh, so make it available for consumption from you know uh, for your uh, end customers then there are options like cloud endpoints and apigee basically you know cloud endpoint is a uh, you know a basic um, uh, api gateway uh, that you can uh, have like let's say your database behind a cloud endpoint and then turn it into an api uh, similarly apigee is uh, uh, also a uh, is much more robust. Uh, it has the functionality of cloud endpoints as well. It is a gateway to begin with. But um, if you have uh, advanced use cases related to APIs, uh, you know, in terms of um, uh, you know API monetization and rate throttling, and uh, at API level DDoS protection and all of this stuff, if you have to do it on your own, it's a lot of work, right? But Apigee, uh, you know, abstracts away all of this and uh, makes it possible for you. And so you'll also see that uh, we talked about catalog and search. Um, there is another uh, you know service which is it doesn't feature here, uh, but it is in you know cloud data fusion. Uh, basically, that can also be used. So these services, uh, I mean, when 
recently data catalog became available um, which allows you to uh, you know which solves the problem of data discovery right uh, so if you have a lot of big query data sets um, and you'd like to tag them and you'd like to kind of discover uh, let's say the sensor uh, let, let, let's say by uh, you know the application owner or by a business unit uh, or by any other uh, tag you know that which makes sense for your business right so basically uh, data catalog makes uh, all of this possible uh, search and discovery um, when data catalog was not available one of the ways to uh, do it yourself was to uh, you know whenever you store an object on uh, google cloud storage you can trigger a cloud function uh, and then as part of saving that object itself, you can actually capture all of the data that is uh, necessary uh, for you to like maintain, uh, you know, where is this data coming from? Where is it destined to go? What kind of analytics that we can derive out of this uh, if we process it? And, uh, you know, what kind of access it should have, which teams, so all of that information in the form of, you know, you know, key value pairs or tags we can actually mention. So basically you can capture this here and then, you know, you can store it in a database of your choice. Uh, it can be Cloud SQL, MySQL, and uh, a small uh, elastic search Kibana layer can talk to this and, uh, you know, build a robust uh, catalog and search, uh, you know, uh, uh, solution layer as well. But then uh, since data log uh, became available, I, we're like really excited about this because I've seen recently somebody uh, not only using data catalog for the discovery of data in GCP, but they have tapped into uh, you know system views, et cetera, available in MySQL, DMVs available in MySQL, uh, in SQL Server, and system tables in MySQL, and start pulling data from there to maintain a catalog here. So I thought that like that's really cool because now you can also you know do the continuous discovery of data in on premise as well and uh, run jobs which you know which are uh, necessary to pull and depend basically it allows you to programmatically deal with on premise data right so so that, that's one of the good features now the most important uh, piece so uh, i have more slides as well but you know, uh, uh, we're kind of kind of trying to dwell uh, more here uh, because you know there is a lot to talk about in, in general, right? So, but I'll try to quickly cover the data ingestion and processing analytics part. Uh, some of these services, uh, uh, you know, Danny already touched upon. If you have uh, huge amounts of data that needs to be tra transferred, uh, you know, in whichever format, right? So, um, if it is not in multiple terabytes, petabytes, uh, then you can still use the command line utilities like gsutil, and then you will see, um, you know, other ways of deploying uh, applications which can transfer data right uh, in app engine or you can you can deploy uh, you know python scripts or uh, go scripts etc in compute engine or in gke which is the managed uh, uh, you know kubernetes platform available on google cloud um, so these are you know similar kind of services but if you run into data related to petabytes uh, uh, you know that physics makes it difficult to transfer over the internet uh, then you can request for an appliance uh, it, it call a transfer appliance and it will, uh, you know, uh, you can load data there and it will be uh, shipped to, uh, you know, the data center of your uh, choice and the data will be made available there. And uh, that is about, you know, huge amounts of initial data transfer. What about the data that keeps changing? Let's say your sensors uh, keep sending data, 15 KB, you know, thousands of sensors every second, they keep sending data, right? So uh, there is one more service which doesn't show up here called IoT Core. Uh, and basically IoT core, you know, PubSub and Dataflow is uh, part of that pipeline. And we have a customer case study. We'll, we'll talk more about it when uh, we get to that slide. But basically, uh, Cloud Dataflow is the managed uh, Apache Beam, uh, which, which kind of excels in, uh, you know, ETL, uh, both for batch and uh, real-time data. So usually it is at the other end of the pipeline uh, where you post data to either Cloud IoT Core for device management, et cetera, or directly to PubSub. PubSub is like Kafka, uh, managed uh, you know, messaging layer, uh, completely scalable. Uh, unlike in other platforms, you don't have to worry about sharding and how many shards and all that stuff is taken care of. You just post messages here um, to the MQTT uh, in interface, then um, you, you trigger, you can either have uh, continuously listening jobs in Cloud Dataflow, 
or uh, you know bad jobs right which uh, uh, trigger and process your data and keep it here and uh, cloud data fusion came from uh, if you are familiar with the drag and drop method of authoring the etl jobs uh, you know talking to multiple databases etc and um, uh, also familiar with uh, uh, some you know etl tools which allow you to capture data lineage as well uh, this is uh, you know one such service basically uh, it's a managed uh, uh, so there used to be a company called cask.io google uh, acquired it and um, uh, it's a product like cdap uh, now became cloud data fusion uh, basically the summary of it is that it allows you to create uh, etl jobs in a graphical uh, manner uh, can talk to multiple databases and can talk to obviously multiple destinations here on uh, in, on the other side and uh, cloud functions is um, uh, cloud composer is a way for you to actually uh, schedule jobs it's a managed uh, uh, apache airflow and uh, functions is uh, you know similar to uh, event driven uh, you know uh, way of solving problems uh, where you just deploy uh, a small function uh, code in a uh, programming language which is supported uh, that solves just one specific problem right so they can trigger uh, you know at the end of a pub sub message or on each uh, object created on uh, there are a lot of triggers available time trigger so on and so forth so th that's about the ingestion part now the processing part uh, BigQuery we've already covered, like it's a, uh, you know, uh, massively parallel, uh, you know, scale, uh, uh, columnar store data warehouse. Um, one thing I would like to highlight though about BigQuery is that, you know, the like the other cloud data warehouses that you might be familiar with, um, one thing that, that's different from, uh, you know, others is that you don't really have to worry about uh, make decisions related to uh, how large a cluster do I need? Do I need a dense storage cluster or, you know, dense CPU cluster? Or do I need to, uh, you know, what is my sort key? What is my distribution key? And do I need to vacuum every, you know, week or every month, so on and so forth? All these are taken care of. It's a completely serverless platform. Um, and then the other uh, processing option is cloud data proc, right? So um, those of you familiar with the Hadoop clusters, uh, so data proc uh, is the managed uh, Hadoop cluster uh, where, uh, you know, you can run uh, the tools of your choice, like, uh, uh, you know, Hive, Spark, or recently things like Apache Hoodie, uh, etc., became available. Presto, uh, Delta Lake, for example, right? So uh, you can run all of this. And good thing about this is, uh, you know, when you uh, run jobs uh, and you know, start scaling based on you know yarn memory, etc., for some of these big data jobs, uh, you want to quickly scale up, process, and uh, you know. Uh, decommission the nodes right so that you don't end up spending too much money um so that is possible i have seen like uh, 100 plus node clusters coming up in 17 seconds right uh, in data proc so it's a really cool service and the um and then the other uh, thing that i would like to talk about is the uh, cloud big table basically it excels in uh, places where you would like to build uh, uh, you, you know uh, where the data is actually uh, time series in nature and you'd like to build analytical uh, services on top of time series data, uh, that's where Bigtable excels. And uh, their other services are, uh, in, you know, are, have been covered. Now they are under the uh, AI platform. Some of them, uh, Vision API uh, and Speech to Text uh, APIs, etc. Et ML Engine is now under uh, AI platform. So we'll skip this. So that's. Uh, I hope that gave you a quick overview about uh, you know how to build an enterprise data lake on GCP. So we've helped uh, a bunch of customers do this. Uh, so I thought we'd share these experiences with you. After the data lakes, um, you know the thing. Uh, in one of the uh, uh, frequent problems that everybody deals with is, uh, you, you know, I have a I have a simple transactional database, and I need to be able to change. Uh, I need to be able to uh, stream these changes to multiple other places in real time, because all of the traditional applications these days have a caching caching layer, and e-commerce companies have you know the search index uh, either in Solar or in Elasticsearch, etc. Now let's say if there is an order table on your you know transactional uh, database, right? So how do you keep it uh, updated in other places as well? Uh, generally, we write uh, jobs, uh, or you know, you uh, you you have at the application layer. Uh, if you are using Redis for the database cache, before making a connection to the database, you will check whether the data is available in cache, or otherwise, you'll seek the uh, you know data from database and get it. Um, but generally, you have to write your own jobs uh, at a certain interval, which makes sense to you, and then keep updating these databases, or you also start writing, you know, this data 
uh, to different different uh, uh, places like that that I mentioned. All so you, your main place uh, is the database, and you would also like to uh, write it to the index, etc. But then, uh, you know, the problem of actually maintaining a global transaction and ensuring consistency everywhere is uh, problematic. In even uh, at MySQL level itself, if you're doing a multi-master, so you know quickly you'll run into issues related to whether really it's a you know feasible approach or not or then you'll start doing a polling method and if you so poll too much then you end up issuing locks on the database uh, that means performance degradation and production databases and all of these ensuing problems right so the solution uh, that uh, this two we have implemented for a customer recently so there is um, uh, so whenever uh, so uh, the orders table uh, gets inserted, deleted, updated uh, on the production database. Um, there is a platform for CDC called Debezium, um, which is open source and which is like gaining traction. Uh, that, in conjunction with uh, Kafka Connect, uh, captures uh, all of the you know uh, the uh, create you know update, delete, and uh, uh, insert kind of statements uh, that are occurring, and it taps into not directly make connections to the database itself, uh, but have you know it can uh, tap into the uh, bin log or even connect etc. Right, so um, it, it will capture all of this and then uh, be able to uh, send messages in such a way that uh, both Elasticsearch and also Cache can understand. And all of this is like seamless, right? Uh, so this Debezium platform basically has currently support for uh, these major databases, SQL Server, MySQL, and Postgres. And um, uh, MongoDB is currently supported. And you know there are other databases which are currently under development. Uh, it's a robust, uh, it's, it's really, uh, you, you know, engaging community, um, and uh, I am sure that they will add more, uh, you know, data uh, things and destinations as well. Um, Kafka. This slide talks about Kafka. I mean, the, most of you would know uh, uh, how uh, important it became uh, in real time event streaming kind of use cases these days. Uh, everybody uses them, and you know, there are things like KSQL that allow you to uh, you know, query data in flight. And all of that is made possible because of this platform, uh, which is Kafka. Apart from being an awesome uh, message log, uh, Kafka has also uh, like community around it where people are building things like uh, Debezium, et cetera, right? So, um, so how does you know, how do you connect uh, using Kafka? Is you know there is a, uh, a framework called Kafka Connect. Um, so it uh, tracks all the offsets and it has a schema support uh, and uh, and there are multiple uh, all the well known uh, traditional relational databases are supported in terms of the connectors and apart from that uh, not so well known ones are also uh, available and. How does it work? Uh, Debezium, you know, uh, initially makes a snapshot and then uh, captures all of this data, as you can see, you know, timestamp and then uh, GTID is null, so on and so forth. How many rows? Where is the position, etc. Right? This is from you know one of the snapshots where we were working on, and uh, this executed, you know, this update uh, customer's query uh, set something with something where ID is some. Yeah. So this is how a high level representation of how it works. Uh, you know, uh, these are your transactional relational databases and Kafka Connect uh, uh, along with Debezium is now speaking to these databases and they're streaming all of these changes uh, like, uh, you know, create, uh, insert, update, delete um, statements and uh, they're being given to uh, the Kafka Connect uh, plugins that we spoke about, uh, you, you know, with ES connector, ISPN connector, JDBC connector, and uh, because you know this understands the, you know, we, it's easy to reconcile these changes on the other side. So the output will, will be something like this. You will see that you know something changed here before this column was null, and then um, you know after that it became ID. It, is this and first name is this so on and so forth right um, and the change uh, uh, happened it's um, uh, inventory database and which table it is happening so all of these details are captured and the operation is probably is an insert uh, you know uh, that's what it, it denotes and uh, it's it says that you know not only just uh, blindly capture changes and then uh, apply them on destination you can also transform them uh, and when it comes to deployment options, you know you can directly speak to uh, one primary database and then uh, have the uh, Debezium and Kafka Connect stream changes. But you can also uh, talk to highly available environments via proxy SQL2, uh, similar. And um, 
you can also do the uh, you know uh, debezium deployment itself in a distributed manner uh, distributed kafka connect and uh, debezium and then you can have multiple consumers and sync connectors so this is when you know you're really pumping uh, tons of data and you'd like to like distribute it uh, so on and so forth and this is actually one of the um, uh, you know plugins that we delivered we uh, like developed uh, the uh, our data architect uh, called bhonesh he built it um, so th this basically allows you to uh, you know track the number of events and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, a monitoring you know the, uh, we know that everybody uses grafana these days so we built a connector for debezium uh, so you can check that out on that link yeah so these are some of the use cases we try to um, uh, some of the use is solved for our customers uh, coming up with real time analytics for uh, you know retail uh, kind of customers right so uh, where uh, there are you know point of sale systems which are you know, sending data some of them tend to be enterprise in nature some of them are using like active mq kind of uh, uh, messaging uh, you know uh, platforms right so uh, we we have helped them move to a you know serverless and cloud native kind of um, uh, environment uh, the services involved there will be popsub the messaging layer um, uh, and data flow i uh, spoke about uh, where we uh, capture we can actually trigger pipelines for both real time and patch uh, kind of analytics um, all of this data stored in cloud storage uh, it's really not that costly so even if uh, it's not like you know uh, so all of this, that, that data lake approach is like by default applied for everything that we do. So we store a copy of the raw data in cloud storage for later uh, analysis of uh, uh, tool of your choice, by tool of your choice. And BigQuery we spoke about and uh, AI platform as well. Um, so, you know, the real time, the analytics, what we mean by real time analytics is, you know, being able to uh, uh, build, you know, provide a view of uh, inventory in real time. Uh, and uh, predict demand in real time, uh, and also, uh, you know, for supply chain kind of scenarios, uh, predict where you need to, uh, uh, you know, analyze the previous data and predict where you need to divert your attention towards in terms of, uh, uh, you know, increasing supply and all of that. Um, so. Similarly, um, the di digital native customers who are already on cloud, uh, you know, uh, there's some cost optimization is something that we have helped them with. Uh, we have seen open source friendly kind of customers running um, huge, uh, uh, you know, big data clusters. Um, and uh, uh, and while uh, the new, that, that ecosystem is thriving, uh, we can certainly actually take a look at uh, what, what you currently have and uh, uh, see if we can optimize by tapping into some of these serverless services out there. So there were customers where, who were billing um, you know, uh, tons of uh, uh, dollars. Um, like you know, there was one customer who was spending close to a million dollar per month, uh, and we were able to like kind of optimize it. Uh, it was a data heavy company. We were able to optimize it and bring it down to you know six hundred k or something like that. It was so seen a lot of uh, uh, you know cost savings there, and. For large customers, uh, traditional enterprise data warehouse kind of deployments. So we 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 are uh, we kind of like uh, wherever the customer is, uh, Teradata, NetEase, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, or Oracle, um, and uh, so we can you know uh, we understand those systems and we have in-house uh, uh, you know enterprise uh, uh, BI people now who can do. Uh, dimensional data modeling, star schema, snowflake schema, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so we have we can help uh, you know such customers migrate away from uh, some of these uh, you know traditional enterprise data warehouses, and so that they can get gain the advantages of uh, running on BigQuery, uh, etc. Right. So and uh, Looker is you know one of the I mean you know, we we can help customers who uh, there were customers who wanted to use more. Uh, 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 deeper tools like uh, Power BI, Tableau, uh, Sysense, ClickView, et cetera. We were fine with it. But Looker is uh, another acquisition from Google recently uh, that is available. So it has Looker ML and all uh, you know cool features. So it's basically into dashboarding uh, and uh, you know NLP-based questions on your data. All right. Thanks, RK. We thank each one of you to join us this morning for uh, this uh, webinar. We hope it was useful. Do feel free to reach out to RK, Danny, or any of us at Sears or Google uh, for any of your questions.